chatting as a leadership yesterday about creating a fuck it bucket <laughs> and just create really cool yeah. ideas to take to clients yes. to put them in uncomfortable situations. I think there's a stat like seven out of ten kids in school that want to be an influencer now when they when they grow up. The, the passion that people have for the video game industry is absolutely amazing. I want to be KSI. I want to be Mr. Beast that mm. I can do this. Embrace AI. Don't be scared of it. Let's embrace yeah. it. Let's just test the waters. Creators are one of the most entrepreneurial like people out there. We're comfortable with being uncomfortable and we generate over 500 million views a month. Welcome to the next episode of Entrepreneurs in the Wild. Excited today to be joined by Mike Craddock, who is a uh, big player uh, in the world of social in and influence and the creative economy. Um, so it's going to be a brilliant episode to look at, you know, what does an entrepreneur look like and feel like um, in the new age of the agency landscape. So, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. I've heard a lot about you and I've been tracking your progress with great interest. Yep. But I'd love to know from your perspective, you know, what, what's your journey been like so far? Um, and, and what made you get into the agency world? Yeah, I feel like I've got a big pressure now after that introduction. It was an accident, if anything. Uh, my background was where I just, I loved video games. So I just loved video games growing up. When I was 17, I watched some videos on YouTube and I thought, mm. I'm better than these. So I figured out, okay, I need to go buy a capture device. How do I film? Yeah. How do I record? How do I put my videos on the internet and show the world? I did that, um, did it in secret, didn't tell my mum and dad, just posted some videos <laughs> in secret um, from my bedroom. And then I managed to build a bit of an online audience and and did quite well. So it ended up actually being a full-time job for, for a number of years as well. Uh, so I did that full-time. So I was a full-time YouTuber, full-time content creator for about four and a half years, played professional Call of Duty as well for a little bit. So I really started to embed myself in like gaming, social, content creation. And these like the early days of YouTube, like... Yeah. You know, when money was just starting to become a thing, brand deals were, you know, um, not really not really a thing, you know, getting paid 500 quid a grand, you know, where nowadays it's millions of pounds. And then all my friends were content creators. I'd built up a really good friendship circle of just influencers and YouTubers. And I, I loved the business side. I loved getting sponsorships myself and negotiating sponsorships. And I think I punched above my weight uh. for, for my size. And I started bridging the gap for my friends. So I was bridging the gap for getting them, getting them brand deals and they were starting to give me 10%, 15%. Mm. I thought, okay, there might be something here. Um, and then Chris approached me with an idea. We spoke about it, we flipped it. And then that's how we effectively were born. But we weren't born an agency, we were born a talent management company. Yeah. And then it's naturally just evolved over time. So that was a two minute background. No, I mean, that that's incredible. And um, I look at the business that you are creating with Chris and your other shareholders and, and it's it's got all the potential in the world mm. you know it's it is such an exciting space and it's an exciting time you know there, it's a sort of new genre of agency animal that's a sort of hybrid of you know talent and creator and and so you know so all sorts isn't it it's very difficult to put your finger on what it is exactly but I think that's part of the part of the appeal yeah and, we, and we've always wanted to like What's next? Yeah. So, you know, we start as a talent management company. We represented friends and then more brands are coming to us and saying, they're great, but can you do something bigger here? Yeah. So then it was, and we rebranded in 2017 to Kairos Media at that point. Then we were an agency, mm. less focused on talent and started doing like bigger deals, started winning some retainers. Yes. Um, and then we kind of come full circle now. It's now, you know, we brought talent back into it. You know, we've got a social, really a powerful social creative and now it's about how do we, how do we bring everything together? Because it's now a really powerful proposition and we're one of the only agencies in the world who has a really strong agency proposition yes. and really on the forefront of social alongside a roster that amasses over 100 million followers and we generate over 500 million views a month on our creators yeah. that we run the content as well. It's like we are one of the only people. So we see like, the sky's the limit in terms of like where we can really go go with it as well. And like we do see ourselves as this, like underdog type agency, but also like able to compete with yeah. some of the biggest as well, which is like for us is like really exciting. I think all uh, independent agencies have this idea about them being <laughs> the dog, e even when they become really big and yeah, well known and all the rest of it. And I think it's just part and parcel of the entrepreneurial mindset. I think mm. I think people need this sense of caper, this this cause um, that's powerful and, and decidedly non corporate. But but also like you know what what you're doing is is a it's a disruptor. You, you know because if you compare yourself to 
the sort of mainstream agency scene, again, so different, mm. like such a different animal, the type of work, the type, you know, what clients expect. It's, it's just so different. So it's, it's, it's just incredible, you know, what, what you're doing and, and I think what, what you represent. And I, and I would imagine that still most of the agency sector doesn't really understand it or isn't really prepared to deal with what, what you're doing. I think they're trying. Um, you know, we work with it, with, you yeah. know, some of the big agencies as well, sometimes helping them out, especially if it's gaming and you know we well, that was our background it's a really strong heritage and sometimes we work with them to like help them understand how do, how to do game for their clients and how they should navigate it but the creator economy in general is one of the fastest growing economies and we're we're really at the forefront of that so we can advise and think you know we're definitely one of the leaders and we feel we can compete with some of the and work with some of the biggest brands in the world and, and, and we do and you know we don't feel like we're at a massive disadvantage against these agencies yet yes we don't have the prestige or you know the glamour or the name, but what we make up for that in the expertise that we've got, and we make up for that for some of the shit hot work that we've done and the case yeah. studies that we've done as well. So, yeah, for us, like it's it's exciting. You know, we we like when we are in a in a pitch and it's who we up against, and they give us a name. It's like, oh, you know, let's have it. Um, mm. <laughs> we don't mind going. Yeah, we think we're in a good position. So, yeah, I think like we're in a really exciting industry is growing it's a bit unregulated and still yeah. a bit messy in some cases and we're trying to evolve with that as well and we've definitely had to evolve our business a few times but yeah it's a really exciting time for us as a business as well i think you know we've got a lot of potential and you know we're really starting to put the gears into yeah. motion as well I, I can see that the industry would embrace you and what you represent I mean, we had uh, an episode with paul baines fair a few weeks ago he, he was sort of talking about the spirits of the of the 80s and the, the Saatchi era when he he was like the MD of Saatchi and Saatchi and uh, he, he was saying that it, it, it is alive and well and there's just just new players and new formats mm. and new channels uh, like coming into the into the mainstream so I, I would imagine that you know the IPA and and the establishment of, of our category will will embrace and indeed be excited by mm. the sort of innovation I think they are in. and I think it's, it's quite nice as well like we we're quite friendly with all the agencies yeah. that are like like us i think when we first started we were probably up against them a bit scrappy like us versus them but i think as the industry's grown as well we are working alongside you know i guess our competitors in some cases mm. we work with them like we pass them opportunities if it's not a good fit for us they pass us opportunities which is like a really nice i think like relationship that we've started to build with agencies like us as well but yeah like you know we're speaking to the ipa yeah. quite quite recently and they're starting to work and yes. like want to work with agencies like us and we're we're now start able to start positioning ourselves better with clients. You know, mm. we were a bit of an anomaly line mm. item a few years back, and now we're like, okay, this needs to be carved out for social, or this needs to be carved out for influencers, or this needs to be carved out for gaming. And that's the kind of bits that we're starting to, you know, work with these clients as well. Yeah, and also we as Iris, we participated in Ad Forum recently, and um, we did we did pretty well. But uh, all, all the intermediaries could talk about was Kairos. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you really are a momentum player, and I, th and I think you are you are emerging, and more and more people are becoming more aware of you and what mm. you what you can do. Yeah, agreed. With well, I think like every agency, we do a terrible job at just PRing and marketing ourselves. Yes. Uh, it's all focused externally, and and, and has been um, for us. So we are a bit more known probably in the gaming gaming side, yes. but now most of our business is now no longer gaming. We've really started to evolve, and it's now like now we're trying to build our brand a little bit in terms of like becoming a bit more yeah. prestigious, well, you know, well-known, a bit out there as well. But yeah, I think we like to try and do things differently. Um, even with the ad forum aspect that we did, we only had, I think, like a 45-minute slot and we were the last one. We had the graveyard, sh graveyard shift. Mm. We're like, oh God, we need to do something, you know. So when they walked in the room, it was one brand. They went to workshops and mm. they came back. It was a different brand and it was like, what's going mm. on? So it's just like a bit more excitement. I think that's mm. just something that we wanted to try and start instilling in our internal team as well to try and keep that creative yeah. flowing as, even as we start to grow as a you know the size of the business as well it's worth us just talking about rebrand because iris is 25 years old and we looked at one or two other brand names before we got going but iris stuck and we, we always had this view that well obviously it's about it's about people and it's you know it's about you know a mate you've been known for the work that you do but we we, we always stuck with it, it, it although you know the the colour changed a bit and the logo has changed a couple of times, but not it's not really changed that much. But if I understand correctly, your rebrand is quite rad, quite a radical shift. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'd be good to just understand a, a bit more about what you've done there and what the thinking was behind that. Yeah. It 
probably accidentally all started in 2017 because we were Kairos Talent. Yeah. Then we were Kairos Media. Then we were Kairos Group. Then we were Kairos Esports. We've made Kaima as a business. We've had Teropium as a business. And I could probably name another 10 business names that we've operated or traded yeah. as or has been part of the group in some capacity. So our brand image has been really confusing, yes. like really confusing externally. And a look internally as well, actually. You know, if you asked maybe a staff member here or a staff member yeah. here, like, who are we? You get two different answers. And that's, for me, a little bit of a scary thing as well. So I would go to an event and someone would be like, oh, you're Mike from Kairos. Another event would be like, oh, you're Mike from Kaima. So like, from even myself, I didn't really have like a, a set identity. It would be yeah. different whom, I, whom I'm speaking to. So... As the business has like evolved, we split those businesses for a reason. We thought it was a conflict of interest. You know, we had an agency and we had a talent division. It was a conflict of interest. We wanted to keep them really separate and operate separately. Mm -hmm. I think that was the right decision at the time. But now fast forward a few years, now brands and clients see it as actually a really good USP. And yes. it's, a, it's really, it's a unique offering that we have and other people don't. So when we sat down as a leadership team, it was, it was okay, we need one brand. We need to go to the world as one brand one name one yeah. image is it kairos is it kaima mm. is it something new like what what do we what do we think here and it was, a, it was a healthy discussion but then we also just wanted to reset ourselves a little bit because yes. we were growing as a gaming business we were a gaming business and that's what we were starting to become known for or a gaming influencer business if i was going to be exact and then 70 percent of our revenue now is no longer that but that's what everyone still perceives us as mm. so when we also then sat down and reflected and went, well, what do we do really fucking good? Like it's innovation, it's creative ideas, it's being yeah. in the forefront of what's new. We want to break what's possible. So it's new forms of marketing, new forms of creators, new forms of audiences. Mm. Okay, well, this sort or this, we need to take everyone in internally on that journey as well. So we felt actually a, literally ripping up a piece of paper and starting fresh would be the best course of action because we don't really have a huge brand anyway. Um, so there wasn't a huge loss, um, I guess, from an external perspective. And actually, we wanted to galvanize everyone internally. So we had people who've worked with different businesses internally. One name, one division, one brand, mm. one goal. That was that was the thinking and the logic. So, I mean, I, I like the name Kairos. Obviously, it sounds a bit like chaos. Good, <laughs> good, good and bad. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, you know, Kairos versus Kronos, you know, mm -hmm. there's, it's an idea. The thing about things like that is they, it's a bit complicated and sometimes it's hard for people to say. And so I think the, the more clear uh, you, you can be and also um, trying to state a claim on a category, you know, I think I think about social chain and I sort of like roll my eyes a bit, but, or we are social or, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They're like, it's a statement. It's very clear what they do. It's, leader, it's yeah. about leadership. Yeah. Um, and it makes it easier to build that brand because... It's, a, it's also a signpost for both talents and intermediary and, and, and also a, a big client who needs reassurance about the expertise, particularly in a sort of uh, agency world where there aren't actually that many good brands. Yeah. Um, so, so where did you get to? What, what, where did you net out as part of that uh, yeah. branding journey? It was a, a long conversation. I think a name K2 was discussed for quite a while, bringing Kairos and Kaima together right. under, under K2. And then we did open it to the leadership team opinions and emotions yeah. always are quite and it actually ended up being me and Chris we were sat in Las Vegas at a bar um, I was like I still strongly feel we need to look at a new name I like new gen or next gen because this is what we do it's all about the new generation yeah. of audiences the next generation of marketeers and that's where we really landed and it's like then it was really well actually everything that we do is really focused on new because next feels like yeah. the next generation is just the younger generation whereas yeah. the new generation is about it's about attitude you know, it's not necessarily about age, not just about Gen Z, it's about attitude, who you are. So we can target gamers who might be 35 to 50 year old mums, but actually they're the new audience of gaming now because whether it's playing on a commute or it's a little bit different. So yeah, for true. us, yeah, we just went like, this is, we target the new generation. We do the new generation of marketing and we do it in a new different way. So we landed on new gen, which is all about the new generation of how we do things today. For me, it, that's a strong, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a point of view, isn't mm. it? It's a manifesto. So it's the sort of thing that, assuming you live up to it, it's, it's, yeah. it's really powerful and um, you know, make, it will make a difference, I think. I think it, it, it also is like reflecting the work that we do. Yeah. Like the work that we want to do is all about new ways to market to yeah. people. You know, 
we want a client to receive a brief and go, I don't know how to fucking do this. Like, I don't know how to speak to this audience or I'm uncomfortable. And we want, we're comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, we want to put people in uncomfortable situations, put clients in, in positions they haven't been and, mm. you know, embrace AI. Don't be scared of it. Let's embrace yeah. it. Let's just test, let's just test the waters. Like, why not? You know, and when we looked back on all the areas that we did well for Kairos, it was, we were one of the first people in influencers. We were one of the first people in esports. We were one of the first people that brought a brand into gaming with mm. like KFC and Activision, a few others. We were one of the first people that we made the KF console, which was a console literally that cooked cooked chicken and, you know, with KFC and that, you know, got billions of views. So it's like, this is what we're really yeah. good at. Like, let's quadruple down upon this. So, yeah. And I think like our journey now is making everyone in our company like think that way as well. And like, Creativity, innovation come from anywhere. So now it's about every single person in this business yeah. needs to be thinking this way. And like, you know, we were chatting as a leadership yesterday about creating a fuck it bucket, which is basically a, um, <laughs> a, a pot of money every month that we would say fuck it and just create really cool yeah. ideas to take to clients, yes. to put them in uncomfortable situations and give it to the staff and say, this is your pot of money. Come up with really cool things and take yeah. it to these clients, um, and that's what we want to be doing, like putting them in comfortable situations. It's part of the reason why people work at, at places like Kairos or New Gen rather than in house, or mm. and, and and also in a world of in housing and outsourcing and AI and tech and you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera, that the role of an agency partner, I think, is about proactivity and originality. So I, I, I love the permission, you know, and, and also. It's all right if it's like utterly crazy or never happen. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's that's yeah. that might be the point. Well, we want a client to walk out of the room and go, "That's mad," but that was quite <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, because <laughs> yeah. if they don't buy it now, they might rethink yeah. it in a year. But at the very least, yeah. they leave thinking about us, and that's what we want to be able to do. Is like just put the thought in their mind. It might not be right for now. It might be good for six months. It might yes. be good for two years. But if we're the agency that at least challenges them, gets yeah. them thinking about us, like we're doing our job. So j just want to talk a bit more about the sort of uh, twin engines that you have, if you like, because you've got your sort of, your creator and talent bus business, if you like, and, you, mm -hmm. and then you've got something that's more like an agency. Is, are the similarities, how does it work? You know, does it, if, if you're, because you've got some of the biggest names in the world, haven't you? Is there anything similar or different? How's it, you know, how's it feel to work with, these, have yeah. these two different kind of facets kind of working in parallel? I love it, but that's because I'm from that creative background. Like, yeah. I'm really passionate about it and I really strongly feel the creative business, just the creative business, will be half of our business in a few years. Um, I think it's got a bit to go, and the agency's naturally more mature, but for me, they do operate a little quite independently, um, but our ambition now is to bring it a lot closer together, but yeah. we are in a position, and this is why we're bringing everything closer together now, is you know we generate hundreds of millions of views a month across Facebook, Snapchat, Discord, TikTok, for our creators. Yeah. You know, we run all of that content, we know the algorithms, we know what works, we know how to chop it down, we know what the audience really cares yeah. about. And so we have all of that data, all of that knowledge and all of that expertise. We can apply that to our brands as well. So we trial a lot of things, you know, with some of our creators because they're mm -hmm. more receptive to trials. So it might be like, okay, we're going to build you a YouTube Shorts for the next three months. Like give us YouTube Shorts, we'll yeah. try and grow it. And if we can grow that to 300, 500K followers in the first three months, it's a proven model. Now, okay, we know what we're doing now. It's a great case study let's take this to Samsung, let's yeah. take this to Pepsi. Like, yeah. look, like, this is a proven model now. We've got a case study. You don't need to take that risk of trialing it. So we learn so much from the social creative side of it and the syndication side of it. And then on the flip side with the talent, you know, if, if a brand rings us up and says, I need a talent in four yeah. hours, we have 100 creators on speed dial that are managed by us that might be able to make that happen as well. Yeah. So we're able to turn things around very quickly um, because of the talent roster that we've got to. That needs a bit of help promoting this podcast. Maybe you can just give me a call <laughs> and I'll <laughs> seed it out. We'll, we'll do your syndication for you and like, distribute it across Facebook and Snap. So. so your background, did you know you were an entrepreneur? I mean, is it, have you got like entrepreneurs in the family? You know, where, where has this come from? Probably a little bit with my dad, maybe accidentally. Um, so my dad's had a, probably a couple of businesses. Mm. Some went well, some not so well. Um, He's definitely like a Dell boy. Um, I'll probably describe him as like, you know, he had one business which was doing really well when I was like 13, 14 maybe. Um, then it all went to shit. Mm. And like we lost, lost, they lost everything. So it's, I've probably seen the highs and the lows yeah. of, of entrepreneurship. Um, 
However, I always liked, I think I always liked business, but in a different way. So I liked it in video games. So when I'd play RuneScape at 11 years old, I hated the idea of like working for money in the game. It's like a really weird analogy, mm. but bear with me. So I would f- merchant and like flip um, items to make more money. Yeah. And then I'd figure out, okay, I actually lose eight hours a day because I'm at school. So if I hire these people to run eggs, <laughs> which was in the game, they run eggs for eight hours whilst I'm at school. When I log in at four o'clock, we'll do a trade. I'll buy all of that and then I'll sell it three hours later when the Americans log in. Mm. And I was flipping money by doing that. And then I'd also like have an online shop that I'd run during the school. So I think I started to learn about like making money, efficiencies, <laughs> hiring. So, you know, and like via video games, I had like 10 people working yeah. for me whilst I was at school. Um, and I was like 11, 12. And that was just because I wanted the best items in the game. So I think I was doing business in a very different way when I was a kid. And then with YouTube, when I started doing YouTube, that I think accidentally is really good for business mm. because you're a solo person creating content yeah. you have to come up with the ideas you have to film all the content you've got to you know at that point you have to edit all the content yourself yeah. and then you start to figure out okay i'm making money from this if i start posting at certain times this will earn more money if i start creating videos mm. at a certain length if my retention goes up and then it's it becomes a game with numbers you have subscribers and you have followers yeah. the higher it is the more you earn and the more influence i guess you have and that does translate to business where mm. the bigger clients you have, the numbers go up and the mm. happier the clients, the numbers go up. So I think YouTube was quite helpful as well. I think it's, it's an amazing space. It's like I spoke at uh, South by last year and I was on the stage and I, and I had to sort of run the run a panel. The, there was um, Janet Lee, the CMO from some Samsung North America. Um, and then there was a lady from August United. She was basically talking about the pro- her process. Uh, what I didn't appreciate was how kind of real time and data driven it is. Mm-hmm. And, and I just did not expect that at all because, from a, t- to the untrained sort of eye like, like myself, you know, you, it, it just seems a bit, you know, random. And but the, the intelligence that goes into, you know, working out what, what to talk about and when and where to, you know, it, 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 what builds is this sort of knowledge about what works. Mm. Um, and, I was like really impressed by how sort of real time and data driven the whole the whole space is. I think creators are one of the most entrepreneurial like people out there, and um, yeah, and I think that showcase with like when I was a content creator, I yeah. had obviously quite a lot of friends. There's some of them that have absolutely blew up, and like now some of the biggest, right? Whether it's KSI and yeah. Sidemen, I was good friends with them. They're doing incredible. The other ones who didn't make it have actually still gone to do really well, but in business. So like you someone like Nade Shot, um, he's kind of made hundred thieves, uh, which is, you know, a hundred, you know, a multi hundred million pound valuation, like esports organizations. There's a lot of those. I think that because they had that mindset of like content creation and entrepreneurship, they've now deployed that just in different in different areas. And I think we're seeing that a lot more as well because mm. it it's like on paper it's an easy job, like you're streaming on Twitch or you're creating YouTube videos, like it does look mm. easy, right? You just, especially when you just see the final output, which is a seven minute YouTube video. But yeah, but the ideation, creative thinking, the editing, the des- the design that needs to go into that, the the targeting, the timing. Yeah. Um, then you also have to do like a lot of networking and collaboration as well. If you want to grow, you know, you need to collaborate with the right creators, you need to work with them, you end up cross promoting, you time time it all. So yeah, I'm not surprised. And then that's, I think now, now that's in our agency as well, that's been deployed mm. also a lot, you know, from some of my experience and others, where it's like, well, how do we replicate this for PewDiePie, for KSI, for yeah. Kaisen out? We need to grow their channels. Okay, we need to look at finite data. When does the drop off happen? Where does this retention? This video did well. Let's try all this. So it's a lot of, especially the social creative and the growth side of our business, a lot of data analysis and optimization just to make yeah. things work because the social platforms just reward retention. So that's what we need to do. We need to keep people's attention for as long as possible. And that's what we do. We like, one of our sayings is like, our job is to stop you scrolling. Like just stop your thumb. Thumb thumb stopping content was was the terminology we used because that's what we need to do effectively. Just thinking about like where you go to next. Um, Obviously you've been building a a really impressive business here in Europe. Uh, If I understand correctly, you're you're also now in the US and, and, and expanding over there. Yeah, so how how do you see that the sort of next chapter um, as new gen? Mm-hmm. America, mm. <laughs> in, a, in a one word answer. We have struggled before to tackle America and really grow in America. Uh, we tried in 2019 first, we failed. Yeah. Um, just weren't ready. 
And we we had to be in New York for a certain client that we won, so yeah. we did. And we just didn't land any other client. The project ran out. COVID happened, so we all came running back pretty quickly. Um, but America is, you know, now 50% of our revenue. So it's really started to grow. Yeah. grow. Uh, we are in New York again. Now it's successful and we're doing well. I think we need to grow that presence. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us. So the future for us is like, what tech are we building and how? Like, you know, the, the world is moving towards a data performance yeah. lens and we need to adapt with that as well. So how do we bring our creator and agency much closer together? Mm. That's a really powerful proposition for us. And we're talking about like getting creators involved in our pitches and we're one of the only people brilliant. that can do that. So yeah, brilliant. I think that'll be very different for us. Um, and then, yeah, America. In the future, we'd, I'd love to do Asia and mm. um, really become a global business, but maybe one continent at a time. <laughs> yeah. um, trying to learn from previous mistakes. Well, yeah, I can tell you, like, in, from my mistakes, um, of which there are many, you've got to take your time and mm. you've got to, like, put it in order. It, it took us, as I, you know, a while to crack America and, and, and it's only really the last few years that we really started to make a successful business that's regularly sort of producing great work and, mm. and clients. It's very easy as a, as a young agency entrepreneur to to get overexcited and try to do everything and um, it, you know it's you've got to take your time and you know b yeah. build it and we'll build it your way as well because um, you know I remember probably eight or nine years in you know we we, we took on investment and it sort of went to our head a little bit, and uh, you know we, we just over overstretched. And, and I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you won't make those sorts of mistakes again. Well, I think we already have, yeah. um, oh, right, yeah. and I think that's maybe a good thing that yeah. we're still quite young. But I think we have messed up quite a few times. That I'm hoping I don't regret saying this in in a couple of years. But I think we've quite learned from some of the mistakes. We we had such a good mm. two and a half, three years of growth, and. It, it felt like nothing could stop us, like absolutely nothing could stop us. And we were winning every client and yes. every opportunity. And it's like, okay, let's do America. Let's build this tech. Let's build a talent agency. Let's build an esports agency. And then we literally did all of it simulta simultaneously. It wasn't one by one, all of it at the same time. Mm. And it worked for a bit. Mm. Um, and then it was like, oh, structure's a bit weird. This is a bit of duplication. America's actually not doing as well as we thought what's actually the tech roadmap that we've got here, like what's actually being built. So, and then, you know, in probably after COVID or maybe a bit during COVID, like yeah. it's, we started to see the cracks and like things were starting to fall apart. Client, client happiness wasn't as good. The retention wasn't as good. Staff satisfaction wasn't as good. And it was like, oh, stop. Um, mm -hmm. Like we did a hard pause, hard reset. Yeah, We trimmed down a little bit as well. And was like, we need to trim down, like find a better base and now we can go again. And I think we've done that now. We've messed up. And I think now we actually are a lot more intelligent for it, a lot more acute to the numbers, a lot more acute to client satisfaction. Um, mm. I'm, gl I'm really glad we went through all of that um, yes. because I think we've learned from it. But now it means when we grow, we shouldn't make that same the same mistakes and we can go a bit slower, slow yeah. down, slow down, speed up. Um, yeah. So that's what we need to do. You mentioned your sort of strong heritage in gaming. And, and also you personally as a as a pro gamer. I have seen lots of mainstream agencies try to get into that space, mm. but I've not really heard much about them being able to pull it off. <laughs> yeah. Have, have you have you sort of come across it much where you see some, you know, some of the big agency brands, the mainstream agency brands trying to expand into into your yeah. um, heritage? Yeah. Uh, you know, publicists have a gaming division now, yeah. Dentsu have a gaming division. Have us have have us play, which is quite a lot in gaming as well. Mm. Um, we work with 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 some of those as well. I think it's really really hard because I think people see gaming wrong. People just see it as the video games, but it, it's not. I, gaming is like uh, we compare it to sport, right? You wouldn't just go, we want to do sport. Yeah, you know, it'd be like okay, because you've got sport, but then you've got football, you've got basketball, you've got tennis. Very different audiences very different ways you need to speak to the audience and gaming is mm. the exact same like if you want to get into gaming sure you can have a gaming strategy but you need to go a lot deeper than that because your league of legends audience is someone who might play six hours a day you know really hardcore peripherals like you know full computer full focus your fifa player maybe is a 24 year old lad who wants to play for 20 minutes 30 minutes on a weekend and and maybe grind some of that out and your call of duty mm. might be a bit more casual so the way you need to speak to every single audience in gaming is like so different. And yes. there's a difference of casual gaming versus esports versus mobile gaming as well. Like, so 
they're all just not all it's a bit harsh but like there's a lot of people who are just seeing gaming as a bit of a broad spectrum mm. and going okay we'll put eight people and that'll that's that's how we'll work it and it's like, it doesn't work like that and where we think we excel is because we've got quite a lot of gamers in the company as well and like that's our background if we get a Diablo opportunity or a Dota opportunity or a FIFA opportunity we'll be like okay who's hardcore at this and yeah. then people raise their hand like you're on this project like you need to come up with these ideas and you need to be in the creative sessions you need to be in the digital sessions could you play it mm. so for us that's no one's necessarily doing it amazingly um, and I f but I also think it's very difficult like it is not an easy easy um, genre to you yeah. know to, to be successful in but I love that because because I, I can see that the whole space is sort of driven by authenticity and passion and being in the culture, you know, being authentic to the culture. You can't really fake it. Um, I, I would say no. And you get but, called out if it uh, doesn't land. I'm I'm sure. I'm absolutely. I'm certain that's right. You have to be in it to to really be be credible and also be motivating for clients to to want to buy yeah. your expertise. And I think that's we always said that's why we think we won business at the start. Because mm. I, I said this to Chris, I was like, why do people buy from you? He's like, oh, I'm not sure, actually. That's a good question. And I was like, so I think I know why people buy from me. Yeah. I think I'm, I get on with them. Yeah. But what I think I am is an expert in the field. Like I can reference yeah. the influencers, I can reference the games, I can reference my backgrounds. I think that's why people do believe in us. And, and, and well, from my side, I was trying to take more on the gaming side. But you are right. But I also think the, the passion that people have for the video game industry and in the video game industry is absolutely amazing. Like, mm. you know, those people that are developing the games, the community managers who have to deal with so much shit online as well. Like, they've got so mm. much passion for it, especially in a bit of a turbulent industry yeah. as well, especially as, as as of recent. You know, it's, they all stick together. Everyone knows each other. There's a very supportive community as well. But mm. yeah, I think that gaming, it, it's definitely had its hard it's hardship in, in recent times it's coming out of the COVID development cycle as well but it's now back on it's like you know hopefully back onto its growth stage esports had its peak and there's a bit of its trough and now it's yeah. stabilizing a little bit so it's all about now just trying to find like where that middle ground is for gaming and where it sits yeah because um, COVID blew it up naturally everyone was inside playing video games and now it's gone back down a little bit yeah. and now we're on a bit of a recovery curve so yeah, yeah we need a bit of stabilization because uh, the industry is a bit bit messy yeah um to be honest I'm just mindful of time. In my previous episodes, mm -hmm. I've asked I've asked a guest about any advice that they would give their younger self. But oh. you're barely thirty, so. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give yeah. it a go. You know, okay. any any advice to the younger Mike Craddock? Uh yeah, I would have got people around me who were more experienced sooner. Yeah, uh, I think we would have <laughs> saved millions of pounds um, and a lot of time if we had people around us with more experience a little bit earlier. I also think, you know, we are where we are yes. because of what we've done. So it's um, trying not to live a, live a life of regret. I would, have, I, would have, I would have also said like, don't do as, don't try and be everything to mm. everyone and really try and find that speciality, that niche, because we were just trying to appeal to everyone. You know, whoever was in the room, we'd appeal to them. We change who we are really um, to appeal to them. And I think a lot of people do that when they're fighting for business, but we just tried to do everything in a year or two years or three years and we just tried to build this behemoth when actually I do think we would have been more successful slowing down taking it a bit steady having a really clearly defined yeah. strategy um, and having a clearer vision for, for the company I think it's a reflection that I've not done well enough of not being really clear this is who we want to be in 10 years time and everyone on the journey so yeah. a bit of a reflection is like set that vision out even if it's clear in your own head it's not clear to everyone else yeah. you need to put on a piece of paper for everyone and on the walls and in company meetings so those are the couple of things I'd change we did an episode with a guy called John Farrell who um, was the uh, CEO of the agency that we broke away from when we set up Iris and and we had a lot of conversation about um, the sort of entrepreneurial spirit in that company and he, he said some really interesting things about um, agencies are not short of ideas or ideas people the thing that makes a difference is execution mm -hmm. um, so agencies that can uh, stick to the plan and clearly follow through on what they're about and <laughs> and execute it they're the ones that become really really successful mm -hmm. um, and, and I and I think there's something in that mm -hmm. um, as 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 you as you know one develops um, yeah. but it's like um and then then the, the only other, and the other thing that he said that was like 
has stayed with me is the really successful and sustainable business that are able to be really collaborative and extremely competitive at the same time. And it's sort of like, it doesn't really make sense. It feels like a sort of oil and water thing. But again, it's really, that stuck with me as well as a sort of powerful part of, you know, building a building a company out. Yeah, I think that's what we're doing quite well. We used to just underprice ourselves, do yeah. great work, make yeah. no money. And now it's like sticking to our guns. This is... You know, we are competitive, but we're also going to do shit it's like really good work. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I uh, agree with all of that. And if yeah. there's one thing I would have done better um, in my position is like, this is who we are in 10 years, like, yeah, on the journey. Or if you're not on journey, like, leave. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. No, no problem. Um, and yeah, we've been internally a lot of businesses to a lot of different people, and yeah. we should be one business. So, a mistake. Well, thank you so much for joining me no. on Entrepreneurs in the Wild. Thank you and, for having me on. Um, Best of luck with New Gen. I'm sure it will be an amazing success and I really look forward to you know, seeing what you do next. Oh, appreciate it, mate. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, listening in and watching. Uh, you can get this episode of uh, Entrepreneurs in the Wealth wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. <laughs>